From the studios of the Optimism Institute, welcome to the Blue Sky Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Burke, and in every Blue Sky episode, we'll be speaking to leaders, researchers, and thinkers whose stories and insights will remind us that there is always blue sky above. Sometimes you just have to get your head above the clouds to see it. It so happens that this Blue Sky conversation is the 50th episode of this podcast. That feels like a big milestone for me, and I've enjoyed working on all of them, including this one, the Big 5-0. And it seems oddly fitting that my guest today has a body of work in podcasting that makes mine look diminutive, trifling, inconsequential, fun size. You get the idea. You see, Kelly Corrigan has recorded more than 400 podcast interviews, and her show, Kelly Corrigan Wonders, recently crossed 14 million downloads. To put that in perspective, let's just say that's 13 million point a lot more than Blue Sky has enjoyed so far. This is all even more impressive when you understand that hosting the Kelly Corrigan Wonders podcast is far from the only thing that Kelly's known for. As an author, she's written four New York Times bestsellers, and she also serves as the host of PBS's long-form interview show, Tell Me More. The Oprah Magazine calls Kelly the voice of a generation, and Huffington Post says Kelly is our poet laureate of the ordinary. I've been fortunate to get to know Kelly through my brother's family, with whom she's a good friend, and she's been kind enough to coach and encourage me in my work as a fledgling podcaster. To have her as a guest on my show is a privilege, and dare I say, a little intimidating. But our conversation was a lot of fun, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Kelly Corrigan, welcome to the Blue Sky Podcast. Hi, Bill Burke. What a nice way to start my day. Oh, that's two of us. I am so happy to have you on. This is a real privilege and so much fun. And I'm a little intimidated because I'm just getting going in this. Yes, and you are yes, a pro. You should, be. you should be very intimidated. I'm making notes <laughs> over here. I'm going to give you like a whole feedback sesh afterwards. Oh, gosh. I am back on my heels already. Well, back to you. Uh, one of the things I have found, Kelly, and it surprised me as I've interviewed people who are optimistic people, have that kind of mindset. One of the things that seems to pull people together is that they're all lifelong learners. I don't know why that is, but that seems to be the case. And you are clearly one as well. Your podcast is called Kelly Gorgon Wonders. And you said wondering is one of your favorite pastimes. So it seems to me if you wonder, that means you've got to be thinking and learning. So why do you think that is and why is it so important to you? It's just a more interesting way to live, you know, like we did this five-part series on the pod about intellectual humility, and it was one of the most resonant ideas that has come up in 400 episodes. We're just about to pass 400 episodes. And these, this fundamental idea that there's, that all knowledge is partial, that there's always something you don't know, and that you misunderstand. Like that's a big worldview. Like that's a religious position to take. And once you take it, it completely changes every interaction because like even if people that you're totally kind of been locked against ideologically, if you thought there's things I don't know, there's things I don't understand, there's things I probably misunderstand. If, that, if that's real in you, then you're in this kind of learner mindset where instead of thinking my goal here is to be heard and to be seen, it would flip to my goal here is to hear and to see. And that's very interesting. Like when you come home from a party and you think, I won. What I'm thinking when I think I won is like I learned the most. And I think it started in grad school. So I went to San Francisco State University for grad school at night to get a master's in English lit when I was 28, 29, 30, working at United Way during the day. And I thought I was going to like, kind of like a serious book club. I was like, I just want to <laughs> be with people who actually read the book and actually make notations. and actually want to talk about it for an hour and a half. Right. 
And then I got there and I was like, oh my God, these people yeah. are brilliant. Like if you're going to get a master's in English lit at night right. at a school like San Francisco State, like you just really love reading, thinking, learning. Yes. And I often felt in those classes, like I'm getting the most, like I'm winning right now because so many of these people barely need this discussion. But for me, I was like, I would take 12 pages of notes yep. a night. Yep. And I thought, I can't believe how much I'm getting out of this. Like this is completely changing my intellectual life. Amazing. And and it also, it, it can't ever end, right? Because you, you also said there's no way to get any of this stuff settled in one shot, right? In one lifetime, there are just too many questions, too many things, unless, unless you're just kind of shut down and you think you've got it all figured out. And that's that's no way to live. It's no way to live and and it's just insufferable for other people. <laughs> yes, I mean, it's, it's just, so, you're just bad company. Once you get to that spot, you're just terrible company. And there's, you know, I had this dad who was, took real joy in the discovery that can happen between people. Yes. And he, he was totally, I mean, he was totally personally unguarded, but he was also like the anti-snob. Right. Like he he was pretty sure that like the train conductor yes. and the 18 year old who was waiting at the train with him and the old guy who looked like he wasn't going to a job anytime soon. Yep. He was sure that they all had stories to tell. Yep. And so it's like a it's a real mindset. Yep. Well, another insight about that, I was I was lucky enough to interview Steven Pinker, and he you know, teaches at Harvard University, and he is really a zealot about sort of open discussion and, co and on college campuses, in classrooms, and he's a scientist. And he said, he said, most of what we know is wrong. Uh -huh. In other words, it, especially in science, he said, so because of that, you can't shut down conversation in a classroom because- Someone might know something that you just think you know, but it's wrong. Right. And if you shut it down, we get locked in, in things that are just not true. And it's a pretty humble thing, like you said, for this guy, Steven Pinker, to say that. Right. He made it. Right. He's like, the vast majority of things we think is not, uh, are no, are true, are not true. Right. Right. And that and that's kind of the the scientific method, which is I'm going to put an idea out there. I'm going to test it and I'm going to discover the ways that it's not quite right. And that it's like a, an endless revision is, is just a, is just the right expectation to have is that it won't, very few things will hold forever. And it is kind of deeply optimistic to think there's more, I agree. there's more behind the next door. There's more behind the next person. There's more behind the next theory, the next discovery, the next iteration, like that's, that's a, an ultimately fundamental, fundamentally optimistic position and worldview is that there's more. Oh my God, there's more, you know? <laughs> I, agree. I agree. And you also, you also believe that the more, you know, the more you can feel, the more you might be a better person. I think though, with that, I think you have to be careful about how you lead, how you learn, what, what do you read? Who do you talk to? Right. I mean, you should talk sure. to everybody. But junk in, junk out. Exactly. I know people who think they're learning a lot all day, but they're on, you know, one side of a debate on on social media and it makes them more hardened and 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 firm in their position. So I think a lot of it and I, I actually saw I read a, a high school graduation speech you gave that one of the things you talked about was try to have a wide range of people in your circle. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, getting to college is a time to do that. And I worry that a lot of people today on college campuses in the first week, they jump into the same sorority or the same team or whatever and don't have that range of experience. Is that fair? Well, I mean, I, I think a thing that's becoming evident right now on college campuses is that they're largely entirely liberal. Like it could be 10% of the student body is conservative yep. or Republican. And I mean, I'm a Democrat, but I don't want to live in a world where 90% of everyone thinks more or less the same way. Like, I, I just don't think there's discovery there. Yep. I, th I think that probably most people contradict themselves right. if they were to go down and take some kind of like 
Myers-Briggs personality test or Enneagram test, but about their positions, their true sense of what, what should we do about immigration? How many people should we let in? What should we do about public education? How should we handle healthcare? Like, should it be more like this or more like this? Like, if you had to separate policy from politics and like the actual positions from the politicians themselves, their personalities and who you want to have a beer with, dot, dot. And you, and everyone had to fill out this form that was like, kind of show me who I am. Yeah. I bet most of us would come out where you would be, it would be like kind of a scattered dot matrix where you'd be like, oh, look, I'm kind of conservative in this way. And I'm kind of liberal in this way. And I'm kind of worried about something. I, I share some concerns that conservatives have and some conservatives share my concerns. Sure. So it's unfortunate that we've got ourselves into this reality where we're not really taking in information from varied sources. It takes like a lot of time and, and intention right. to say, oh, I'm going to read, you know, like sometimes when I'm staying in a hotel, which I hate to do, I always <laughs> stay with friends when I'm on the road because yeah. I get nervous in hotels for some reason. It's so dumb. <laughs> but if I have to stay in a hotel, I can't find any friend in whatever town I'm in. Um, I, often toggle back and forth between MSNBC and Fox. Yeah. And I just think it's really valuable sure. every now and then to see how, even what stories they're covering and much less the way that they're covering the same story differently. Kelly Corrigan says that our lives will be more interesting if we embrace intellectual humility. And I agree. And I really like the idea of leaving a social gathering and feeling like you've won if you learn the most of anyone there. I know I could use some work on that front as I tend to talk more than I should and I do well to ask more questions and do a better job listening. And I learned something else here from Kelly. I've seen this common thread run through so many of my Blue Sky guests that they all love to learn and I've wondered why. Kelly cracked the code, I think, when she said it's an optimistic position to believe there's always more to learn. At this early point in our conversation, I've already learned enough from Kelly to declare myself a winner. But wait, there's more. And getting back to our conversation, I wanted to talk to Kelly about how we get back to more civil discourse. And I mentioned another Blue Sky guest from whom I've learned a lot. Kevin Kelly also wrote that when you sit down with someone, get to know someone, have a discussion, you start with all the things that you share in common. So let's say you're on different political sides of, of the spectrum. And he said, you'd be surprised by the time you're done with that, you realize that your differences are way on the margins, right? You all want your kids to be happy. You all want the air to be clean. You all want people to be safe. You all you want the country to stay out of war, right? And then you realize it's these little things on the margin, and then you can talk about that, but it's a much better conversation than leading right away with the big things that you disagree on. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think one really weird, interesting place to let a conversation go or maybe even nudge it in that direction if you're looking for a little shared humanity is pain. Mm. So if you had a bad back or you had knee surgery or mm. you tore your ACL or you get migraines or you're in menopause or you know your parents are having cognitive decline, but like the things about our bodies that we live in sometimes can be so sympathetic. Yep. You know, like people can really feel each other. When you when I meet someone who has migraines, I've had some migraines in my day that have like taken me to the ER, 3 days, cat scans, IVs, the whole deal. I mean, I don't care what their position is on <laughs> pro choice pro life. <laughs> right. You know, like yeah. we are people together. It it totally transcends my positions yep. on charter schools. It's like, "Oh my god, I want to just hug you." Right. Right. You know, or if you had breast cancer sure. or if you had melanoma or you have an unhappy child. I mean, there's so many places where everything instantly falls away. So if you could just get there faster, yeah. you, then all of a sudden the, the rest of it seems very, very marginal. I mean, it's interesting. It's interesting to think about how much energy um, transgender issues and rights have taken up in the public forum 
and how small, very small a community that actually is. Yeah. So it's a, it's like a trick. It's like a way to suck people into a verbal war that is, is actually like, why don't we just look at the federal budget and start from the biggest chunks to the right. smallest? Right. We're never going to talk about the, NE, the NEH or the National Endowment for the Arts. Like right. they don't matter. Like let's talk about the top three because yeah. that's where it all lives. That's where all, it's, that's the 80-20 rule of American life. Right. But we get sucked into, we get tricked into like by the media, we get tricked into having these conversations about who should be able to swim in which event. And it's right. like, what right. are we, why are we doing this? They, they fooled us. They hooked us. Right. Right. When 20, when 20 minutes of a presidential debate is about who can go to which bathrooms, it's just like, it seems to me that's not the best use of our, of our time. Right. Incredible. So I have to talk about your dad because I've, I've read so much of your work and you brought it up first. And I know he's just such a formative person in your life. Um, you said some lovely, you've written lovely things about him. I, I love uh, his default s setting is open delight, mm -hmm. which is beautiful. Um, but I particularly loved, according to my dad, the world was beyond safe. It had a sense of humor. It knew your name. It was waiting for you. Hell, it was even rooting for you. Mm. To me, if we could all approach our lives assuming that the world is rooting for us, it could change so much. Can you reflect on that? Yeah, it, it comes from this funny thing that my dad used to do in the mornings where if we couldn't, if we wouldn't get out of bed, we were all in high school at the same time. I was a freshman, Booker was a junior, GT was a senior. And my dad, after many years of my mom uh, suffering through the experience, my dad took over the morning routine and it was his job to get us out of bed through breakfast into the car with our books. And then he would run us down to school and, you know, it was brutal. I mean, getting three teenagers into a car with their teeth brushed yeah. is just like this. It's a trick yeah. that just won't resolve. And so anyway, he would do this whole insane routine where he would stick his head out the window and be like, hello, world. And then the world would say back, <laughs> hello, Georgie. And then he'd say, I'm coming out there to get your world. And the world would say, I'm waiting for you, Georgie. And <laughs> that was like his worldview, his fundamental worldview is that it was a friendly place. It was responsive to you. If, if, you, went, if you went out there to go get your day, it, you could find it. He's super high agency person, like felt like, you know, you get what you give and like you go first, like give first and it'll, it'll all turn out. Okay. Right. Instead of that cross-armed victim position where you're like, no, you give first, you know, you show me that you're a good guy or that you deserve my attention or that you're worth my time. And then maybe I'll lean in. He just leaned in. And consequently, the world responded in a certain way. I mean, that's really the, the craziest thing is that you are essentially like making the world a certain way based on the way you approach it. Like it is not the same world person to person to person. And if you're out there like being a life eater, which is what yeah. I used to call him, and, and just embracing everybody your life experience will be fundamentally different than the guy with his arms crossed, uh, you know, across his chest, waiting for somebody to deserve him. That's just a different person or waiting, watching and waiting and assuming everybody's going to yeah, screw right. it up. Like that's a way that people go through life. And consequently, everywhere they look, people are right. screwing up. But the agency yeah. is deciding yeah. where to look. Incredible. Yeah. And it's, it's little things. And he did this from everything you've written. You know, you're at the, the checkout count, counter at Christmas time and everybody's ha harried and, and the person's ringing you up. You say, how's your day going? This must be a busy time of year. Phenomenal. And sometimes it's like they've been, they've been yeah. shocked into conversation and it's always pleasant. It's always appreciative, right? I, it's right. just, and there's so little of it. Great. And then you walk away thinking, yeah. what a great kid. I mean, yeah. it's, don't you love, I love like the, every hourly worker I inter in, interact with in a day, I'm like, I am going to blow life into you. You know, I'm going to be the one who's like, brings you back from just like blowing and going and like hitting the numbers on the register, or, 
There are no registers anymore, Bill. I don't know what I'm talking about. That was so anachronistic. Yeah. Takes yeah, my that's true. Apple Pay. Yeah. I don't know. No, but, but anyway, it's, yeah. It's true. But you're making the world. You're making the world do something different. Did you ever, were there ever times in your life, I, I imagine when you're a teenager though, and your dad's saying, hello world and all this stuff, was there ever sort of an eye roll or gosh, like, come on, you know, or, or is it just, did that breathe into you as well from an early age that stayed with you? There must've been an eye roll but I don't remember it. I was so, I was so comfortable with my dad. Like the, the thing I always felt is like, if you were my age, we'd be best friends. Like I, there's nothing, there's nothing I didn't like about him. Like I, I just loved his company. I loved talking to him and, and I loved introducing him to people. Like I just, Man. that's how you knew that you were important yep. to me. It was like, we got to go have lunch with my dad. Like you got to meet him. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I roll my eyes at him. I mean, a thing about him that was kind of neat that I think about a lot now with my kids is can't get enough, don't need a thing, which is to say, he, what he was giving me was, I can't get enough of you, but I don't need a thing. If you want to move to California for 25 years, if you want to come home the week before Thanksgiving instead of Thanksgiving, if you want to have us come out there for two nights and watch your kids while you go to, you know, New Orleans for jazz fest, like whatever, like we, we have no requirements of you. We are not going to pressure you. And I didn't even know that was unusual until I lived with someone whose parents really put the screws to her about moving home from California. I mean, every conversation ended in frustration for her because they just guilted her nonstop for two years until she moved. And I just thought, God, I, and my mom, like my mom accepted me as I am from the jump. She did not, she was not constantly editing me. She didn't have all these opinions about what I might try doing next, or have I called so-and-so, or I like that dress on you better than that skirt, or you may, why don't you cut your hair? I mean, nothing. She did not, she was not operating on that level. And so that, I really try to embody that. And it, it's a little bit harder for me than it seems to have been for them to not to not need a thing because I want them. I really want them around. To read Kelly Corgan's books is to fall in love with her dad. His upbeat and optimistic spirit comes through in his daughter's descriptions. And I've no doubt that adopting his mindset that the world is rooting for us would do us all a lot of good. And as Kelly says, if we can all be life eaters like her dad, a great expression, by the way, our lives could truly be fundamentally different. We'll now turn to Kelly's mom, whose personality is different from her husband's, but is equally impressive. Dad was often the go-to, but we're going to transition here to talk about some of the challenges you face. And when you had, when you found out you had cancer and you were really scared and at your worst, it was often your mom who you wanted to talk to. Yeah, she's um, she's a real go-to person in mm -hmm. a storm. She can really think through a problem. She can get down to like a to-do list pretty fast. And she doesn't crack. And she's efficient and very can-do. So the, the first time I really saw her in action and thought, God, that was comforting was I had a panic attack in New York City. So I was making this educational, at the end of my master's degree, I made this educational software to help kids learn Shakespeare. I was super into Shakespeare in grad school. And I was like, kids don't get it and I can make them get it. And I'm gonna beat Cliff Notes and I'm gonna make this really fun interactive software where they get to cast the play and, you know, and then reset it in Shogun <laughs> Japan or in the 1930s US culture and, Anyway, I, I was so into it. And I went to sell it to Kaplan Test Prep oh, yeah. in New York City. I remember So I was that. like way over the tips of my skis. Like I didn't yeah. I had no business doing any of this. But it was like the end of the the end of the century. 
sound so old, but it was yes. when the dot com thing was like everyone had a crazy C time. corp. Absolutely yeah. crazy time. I mean, I was in San Francisco, so yeah, everybody crazy. was like had shares in something. Yeah. So anyway, I went to do this deal at Kaplan and I totally had a panic attack. I'd never had one before. I'd never heard of them before. I'd never Ugh. heard of I didn't know they had a name. Yeah. And I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna I'm gonna walk out of here and like jump in an ambulance. Like I think I'm having some kind of I don't know, pre aneurysm or something yeah. like I couldn't figure it out. So I came home and I sat down at the kitchen table and I said to my mom, I think something's happening to me. Like, I think I might be having some kind of cognitive event. Hmm. And she was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. I've, I've, I felt like my heart was racing. I felt like I had like a strap tied around my head that somebody was making like tighter and tighter and tighter. Ugh. I couldn't really see Ugh. with clarity. Like people were getting kind of farther away from me in the room. Their voices were getting a little further away from me. Wow. And it was all kind of like got very dreamlike. And I felt like, I felt like somebody drugged me mm. and she said, well, hold on a second, <laughs> George, <laughs> give me your wallet. And she went and got his wallet and she pulled out his insurance card and she called the people right in front of me, like as if she just did this for a living, you know, wow. as if I hadn't just told her something that was so unsettling. Right. And hello, this is Mary Corrigan. <laughs> I am calling because my daughter has had some kind of attack or event and we need to talk to the kind of doctor that would deal with such a thing. And, Who's she you know, calling? Is, it, calls, she, is she calling someone in New York? She's calling like the 800 number. <laughs> she's calling the 800 number on the insurance card. And they forward her to the next person, to the next person, to the next person. And like right in front of me, she figured out a place that we could go that day to talk to a psychiatrist and say, what is this? Wow. And that woman said, it's called a panic attack. It's, it's called an anxiety attack. And I was like, I don't know what that is, but boy, am I glad this thing has a name. Yeah, like, right. I can't tell you how delighted I am that this is like a known thing that has happened to other people. Yeah. And so anyway, and then she said, um, you know, you don't, don't, you go back to California whenever you want. You know, I was like due to go back to California in two days. Yeah. And she's like, don't you just stay here as long as you want. And then I had $6,000 on my credit card because I was working on this yeah. little startup. And she said, I'm just going to pay your credit card bill. You can pay me back five years from now. I don't care. And just like swatted the flies away. Just whatever's scaring you, yeah. I'm making it go away right in front of your eyes, like a, like a magic fairy godmother. Incredible. So then when I had stage three cancer as a 36 year old with a one year old and a two year old, she just was like, I'm going to call Betty Moran. I, I know uh, Tori Birch is a friend of ours and she's mm -hmm. on the board of Sloan Kettering. We're going to find out what they know. Uh, here's what I've learned about the best doctors in your area. You could certainly come home and do your treatment, but I'm sure you and the girls want to stay together. Your father will come first. If you prefer, I could come first. We'll take turns Gosh. every other chemo. I have airplane miles. Don't you worry about a thing. We can tell people. We cannot tell people. Like it was like, She'd been training for it her whole life. Like she's like a Navy yeah. SEAL. Right. And there is just nothing more comforting than competence. Right. And calmness. I mean, it sounds like she's just in the middle of the storm. She's like the steady lighthouse, right? She's just calm. The most she said was, oh my God. So I said, mom, I, and you know, I was crying. I was like, mom, I have to tell you something. And it's kind of a big thing and whatever. And she said, uh-huh. Uh huh. And I said, I have cancer. And she said, Oh my God. And then she said, Back up. Tell me what happened. And it was like, just, she, I could tell she was writing everything down so that, you know, when she like caught back up with herself and could set her emotions aside, she could look at it again and study it and then make informed decisions about what to do next. And wow. I mean, that's just a really heavenly reaction. Unbelievable. And, you know, I don't think I'm that person, honestly. Like, I'm sure I would just weep. <laughs> I'm so emotional. I'm so much more emotionally unhinged than yeah. my mother was. Yeah. That my kids called me and said they had cancer with yeah. two kids in diapers. Like, right. I mean, I, I, yeah. I'd get there, but not that fast. Right. No, what you described sounds pretty unusual to me. 
And your your writing, you know, it's a lot of what I've read at least is is really memoir writing. And you are so open about your hardships and that sort of thing and all that you've been through. And you said somewhere that once we reach 50, everyone is broken. And then you say, and broken people are better. Can you talk about that? Because one of the things I find is that some people think, well, if you're an optimist, that's, you're a fool because, you know, all these terrible things happen. And and really, I, I get concerned about some of the happiness literature because I think everyone is just seeking to be happy all the time. And it's like someone famous, I can't remember who it was, said, the best way to be happy is not stopping to wonder if you are. And And sometimes I just think that we're so obsessed with that. And so for you to be able to flip it and say that everyone's broken and broken people are better, I think is really powerful. Can you talk about that? Well, if you back out of this this known super fact, which is that the number one driver of human happiness across time and culture is meaningful connection to others. Yes. Then brokenness is the super highway to connection. Right. Like that's when it all happens. I mean, you don't even know people, you know, you don't know people like an ordinary day does not allow you to really know another person. It's just, I don't know. I, I think it's very unusual for people to even be able to feel their lives or like feel how much they want to be here yeah, and how much it means to be here still. And yep. then these moments happen. Someone in your town kills themselves. A marriage breaks up that you thought would never end. Uh, a person's kid becomes schizophrenic. And all of a sudden you're like, like this yeah. is real. This is this is what we've been training for. This is this is what friendship is designed to address. And I, I was I lived I raised my kids in this little town called Piedmont, California, which is right uh, near Oakland, California, in the East Bay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Very small town, two miles by two miles, ten thousand people. And you know it's it's an idyllic place in many ways. Many many trees. No yeah. power lines, parks, <laughs> birds, yeah. Yeah. good coffee, <laughs> high-end sandwiches. You like know, me. you're there. And you start, you know, your little kids are in kindergarten and everybody looks good and showing up to pick them up. And it all seems really like it just couldn't be going better. And then you live out those 12 years with people, you do the K-12 thing with a whole group of people and you just watch as like lightning strikes. So I kind of went first with the cancer thing, but then every other person around me took their hit. And in so doing, like that's where we became like in a unit. You can't really be that close to anybody without something terrifying to walk with them through. It's just all so superficial. It's all so dumb. You're just talking about like where you're going on vacation and if you're going to get these marble counters for your kitchen remodel. Like it's dumb. It's all dumb. And then it's not. And then it's like, this is what we're here for. This is, this is what. The point is, is this is what we've been building is this whole world together where on this day I can show up or you can show up and we can like do it together. Yeah, that's, it, that makes so much sense to me. We raised our kids largely in a, in a very similar town all the way across America in Maine, 8,000 people, Cape Elizabeth, Maine, exact same thing you just described. And when you're little, everything's hunky dory and everyone's doing great. And then they start coming. And I find back to where you were talking before about your dad and others and how you can really connect with people through these shared challenges in some ways, people's guards drop so quickly because sometimes you're having the small talk. How's it going? Oh, we're good. We're going to doing a new kitchen, whatever. And then how are you? And then you honestly say, oh, our kid is having a really tough time with blah, blah, blah. Or we just lost a, someone to cancer. And all of a sudden, the whole conversation shifts, shifts. And more often than not, I find people say, oh, wow, that happened to me when I was growing up or that just happened to my, and then all of a sudden it's a whole new conversation 
And to your point, it's, it's not dumb anymore. It's like a real conversation. And it's incredible how much we all share, but we don't talk about it enough. Yeah, I think we really, I think we really want to be used up. I think maybe that's the point is like to be fully used up by the end. Like that you, every, every experience you've ever had is coming into play one way or another in service of some other person's latest bump, you know, like that's the, that's the goal is that you would feel everything hard every emotion and that you would be able to be in service like and and that the upshot of all of your hardest days is that you would be in service in new ways my my cousin Kathy who is like a sister to me I don't have any sisters um lost her 18 year old son the summer after freshman year in college he was in a car accident and he and the other kid died and um you know, so a police officer like came to her door at two in the morning and stood on her porch and she went to the site and sat on the side of a hill and watched him take this body out. And, you know, wow, horrible, horrible, horrible. The worst. She's like one of the most useful people. In every circle she's in, she's the one who can save you. You know, she's a minister of, in her own way. She, she's a, she knows things and people know she knows things. And I will say like that, that cancer thing in my thirties, like really gave me membership in a circle of people who had gotten hit from behind. And yep, that membership has been the most enabling feature of my daily life because it's just, there's no feeling as good as being useful to somebody like to feel like I really helped somebody, you know, get their head around some emotion or some life event or made them less lonely in it. Yeah. Like that is very very high order stuff like that's yeah that's the whole thing right like there's just nothing (laughs) more than that there's just there isn't i've said many times on this show that a hallmark of optimists is their ability to quickly turn from seeing a problem to providing a solution kelly's mom embodies that attribute here Her first reaction to learning of her daughter's cancer is, oh my God. Then within seconds, she's putting together a game plan to get her well. And Kelly offers a terrific insight when she says, broken people are better. And I think it's true that we get much closer to others when we're going through something serious. She follows all this up with a line worthy of a refrigerator magnet or inspirational poster. There's no feeling as good as being useful to someone. Now, back to our Blue Sky conversation, starting with another line written by Kelly. I'm going to share another quote from you, Kelly, which is, more and more, I feel that what that's what we're here to do, is to experience the whole crazy wheel of emotion, and that to know one is to know its opposite. To know fear is to know security, and to know worry is to know peace, and to know loss is to know love. There's a pretty big payoff to every hard moment. If that doesn't help you get through the tough times and and stay optimistic and hopeful, I don't know what else is. That's beautifully articulated. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, it's funny. There's this kind of, there's this run of books right now that, um, are talking about connection and listening. And yes, I felt somewhat amused like hey welcome to the party gang like by the <laughs> this new concept yeah by this <laughs> big new concept like hey guys <laughs> gather around you're not gonna believe yeah. what i've discovered Ooh. yeah if you really listen to people and you really connect your life will be better 
Yeah. But it, but it might be that it that there's a male female element to it, and that what we might be doing in this moment culturally is guys saying to guys something that if a woman said it to a man, he couldn't hear it. But if if a guy says it or the right mm. guy says, "Hey, gang, this is really going to change your life," that maybe there's an yeah. openness there because of the messenger to receive the message. Yeah. But um. I, my husband uh, is a biker, like a road biker. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. you know, it's a very funny, easy thing to make um, cracks about because the outfits are so insane. Yes. And. Yes. I, I used to do it. It's 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 yeah. rough. But There's yes. just a thousand ways to poke holes. You can't look. Yeah. And you're clopping around. Oh, the it's shoes. just. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a goofy thing. <laughs> but he's yes. like, Kelly, the thing you're missing is it's the thing you want from me the most, which is when I go out there for five hours, I am talking to these people. And the way I'm talking to them is way different than the way I would talk to them if we were out to dinner with somebody or if we were at a cocktail party. Like because the rides are 70 miles, people are sharing so much. And it is for sure like the the best parts of his week are these rides that these guys were there comparing notes in a way that they they don't in ordinary life. And that's awesome. Yeah. Now, I've experienced that. And another thing that gives me hope on this front is as awful as the current wave of mental health illness in, uh, in kids and young adults is, it's a little early to tell, but I've read, and I actually think it was on the Daily Podcast, I heard someone talk about, it seems though that when kids, if they're able to get their arms around it and get the right treatment and get the right counseling, they come out the other side as much, to your point, much better people, much more empathetic. I know someone who went through it as a teenager, whenever there's a crisis or an attempted suicide, you know, when people head for the hills, he heads to the hospital, you know, to see the kid and reach out. And I think... I think we're going to see a wave of that, I hope. But it seems that there's some really credible research, anecdotally and otherwise, that suggested that that could be the next wave if we can help get kids through this. That's interesting. So um, I have a show on PBS. It's called Tell Me More. And the tip, for the first five seasons, all we did was interview like the biggest names we could get. So it'd be like Judd Apatow one yeah. week and Steve Kerr the next <laughs> and David Byrne the next. And then we started to like put a theme on it. And the theme for this season that we're just about finished filming, which will go up in April of 2024, yep. is what is well-being? How do you get it and how do you keep it? Hmm. And so we talked to 10 of the best scientists and researchers in the country trying to understand what are the relationships between mood and movement, mood and food mood and connection, mood and spirituality. And we sort of went through all these different parts of an ordinary life to understand, talked about uh, medication. We talked about genetics. We Mm. talked about uh, nurture, early environments, early relationships and everything. We we were really trying to surface like what is the date, what's the best data available right now telling us rather than like, what are the Instagram influencers or like the TikTok kid who's mouthing off about, you know, who's got ADD and who doesn't. Yeah. And I did have this feeling, this kind of meta feeling over the course of doing all that filming with all those different researchers that something new is coming and it's partially related to technology because Mm. we are going to be able to do things that we've never been able to do before. And if a lot of this, comes back to neuroscience, like talk about a thing that is benefited by technology. Like it's such a complex organism. Oh yeah. And so you really need like, um, high level computing to, to do some of the things that you would want to do to look at a brain, um, and the neural connections and pathways and neuroplasticity and all that kind of stuff. Then the other thing that seems like we might be dawning is that a lot of our mental health conditions have a metabolic component. And so all in, I thought, one, what you thought, which is it'll be very interesting to see this generation of kids who 
many of whom have done therapy, many of whom have used medication, many of whom have done deep reading and study into their own well-being, mm-hmm. many of whom are trying meditation and other sort of spiritual pursuits. Like what, what, what kind of adults do they make? What kind of decisions do they make? What kind of corporate leaders do they make? You know, just, it'll just be interesting to see. And, you know, all these pandemic kids, like God help us that just the, the hit there's, I think, going to continue to reveal itself, like the ways in which that stymied growth and development. Yeah. But also I wondered, Oh, are we, are we about to like, reframe some of our thinking in a way that's super beneficial for all. Like we are about to get better at taking care of our mental health. Maybe I I felt optimistic about it. There you go. Well, at least we're talking about it, right? I mean, that's step one in any of these things. So that's, that's a fascinating. And we're uh, questioning like in in the scientific way that we talked about, like we're, we're wondering in that way, that's really powerful what's working? Is this working well enough? Like are the side effects of this? Like how's the efficacy? Like how does this compare to that? Yeah. And so. Well, it's just brain plasticity. What we were talking about before, but most of what we know is wrong. No one believed that for the longest time. The people who first started pursuing this idea of, of brain plasticity, it was like, no, 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 the brain's pretty much fixed. You know, you can learn, you can do this sort of thing, but you're not going to change the structure or the, and, and that's just, we were wrong. And so, I know, isn't that wonderful? It's incredible. Isn't that like the best news you've ever heard? No, it's incredible. It's, that you're not just like cooked and just slowly dying. Right. Like it, it, the story before this, before neuroplasticity, the story was you peak and then it just gets worse every yeah. single day of your life and then you die. And or and or you're wired to be this this way and that's the way you're going to be. Um, I interviewed a guy named Richie Davidson who, who teaches at the University of Wisconsin and he's he spent a lot of time with the Dalai Lama. And he's a neuroscientist, so, you know, 70s and 80s, he's studying everything that goes wrong with your physical brain. That's what he did. And he goes to meet with the Dalai Lama, and the Dalai Lama said, why do you study all these people that have having all these problems? What if you studied brains that are functioning really well and research that and then maybe help people get – turned his entire career around? And he's on the leading edge of talking about neuroplasticity and ways you can do it, whether it's mindfulness or gratitude or all these practices. And you come away – talk talking to this guy, just you feel fantastic and hopeful and optimistic. I think, I think you're right. I think we're onto something with that. I was going to ask you, what's been the biggest aha? Let me just add a person. Yeah, please, please. There's a woman named Samantha Boardman who wrote a book about called Vitality, I think. And she's a psychiatrist in New York city. And I interviewed her for our pod, but also I, I know her socially. And she had that same shift where she was just working with people around depression and like alleviating suffering. And then she was like, but what if we could get past like the midway point and get into vitality? What if the goal was vitality? And um, so anyway, I've really valued her work. Reminding ourselves that as Kelly says, there's a pretty big payoff to every hard moment is a great way to help get through the tough times that life will inevitably throw our way. And if you haven't seen Kelly on PBS, you should check out her show, Tell Me More. The new season starting in April sounds amazing, and I'm sure you'll see ample evidence of Kelly's experience and abilities as an interviewer. She is a true pro. And now, our final segment. A last question before we wrap up. That that season sounds fascinating, and you mentioned a few things you've learned. Is Was there to the extent that you like to wonder and that's your pastime and you like to be learn new things and be surprised, has, has there been one or two huge surprises or big ahas from that work that when you started it, having these interviews, you didn't think you'd find out? One thing is that um, even the best scientists disagree with one another about the finer points of the research and like what you can extrapolate from any given study. So there's, it just means that we're going to have to be very grown up in the way that we receive uh, media stories about science and research because it's um, it wants to oversimplify the media. And so it's going to give you a cheaper version of the story. And so it's going to take a very mature readership to say, yes, like variation is the norm. What worked for Bill might not work for me. What worked for Bill's kid might not work for my kid. But the mind, interestingly, 
wants to glom onto some pattern as fast as possible because it's exhausting. It's metabolically expensive, as Lisa Feldman Barrett, the great neuroscientist, says, <laughs> to, to deal with uncertainty. And so we're, we're pu- being pulled towards um, a top line conclusion at all moments. That's what our mind wants. The other thing that came up that I was stunned by is there's a woman named Leanne Williams at Stanford who is so such a special thinker. And she's trying to really have a sea change around how we deal with mental health stuff by creating precision medicine for mental health, as has been done in cardiology or HIV or cancer. Like, you know, 70 years ago, somebody would have said to me, I have cancer. Maybe it's leukemia, maybe it's colon cancer, maybe it's breast cancer. Like, but this is like very different things with very different treatment protocols now. And we and think about the where science was and where technology was in terms of processing information 70 years ago when we were starting to make finer statements about cancer and cardiology. So she's ready. She believes that we need to put fMRIs into the practice of treating mental health because there are these different neural superhighways that she's identified to say, oh, you have subtype one of depression, which means that you'll respond really well to something like Zoloft. You have subtype two, which means you won't respond to any of these SSRIs. And what really you need is a, is a fitness trainer and a nutrition coach. And you have subtype four. Subtype four does really well with CBT and group therapy. Like, and, and it was so exciting to me to think, right, of course, like we have been using such blunt instruments. And now we could, of course, get much more granular about what's the difference between your depression and my depression. And therefore, how should we treat it? Because what we're doing now is so many people, like the average person has to try four medications before they find um, a medication and a dosage that's effective. And even then it might not be effective forever. It might just work for six months. And the side effects are tremendous, like really tough set of downstream problems that you're left with. And So there just has to be a better way to get people back on their feet. And I think she's a person who might get us there. And that was so exciting. I mean, talk about cause for optimism. Uh, Exactly. I think the pace of change and the the brink of developments that we're on right now is so underappreciated and an untold story. So I'm glad you're, you're shedding light on that. Last, last question. Speaking of untold stories, and you mentioned readership. I'm assuming your writing days are not over and that you're working on something. Is there a next Kelly Corrigan book that we can all look forward to in the near future, far future? Because you're always going to write, I assume. Yes, yes, yes. There <laughs> no is. pressure. Um, no pressure. Um, I just, I had a, I had 250 pages that I've been working on uh, intermittently over the last five to seven years. And I just set it aside. Yep. And then I had a new idea that I started writing into and talked to my editor about. But literally just this morning, I got asked to give a TED Talk at, at TED 2024. No way. Which is in April. Nice. Yeah. And the, and the idea that we had been, ta- I had been talking to this woman who called me from there and said, you know, I don't know if you have ever thought about it, but I read your stuff and I have an idea for you. And the idea that she put in front of me was so compelling to me that I felt, found myself writing instantly, like writing into this idea. No way. And so when she she texted this morning, and then we just FaceTimed minutes before I jumped on. on with you to say, yay, this is going to be so exciting, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, oh, that, that could be, because I have this forcing function, because I have to stand up in front of all these people yes. and say something yes. meaningful, I have a feeling that it might actually shift what what I'm working on and it might sort of lay the groundwork for something new. This is breaking news on the blue sky podcast. Breaking news. Yeah, that's it. I got to get this out. We got to (laughs) go. 
Kelly, it has been as delightful as I thought it would be. You're just incredible to talk to. I've really enjoyed the research for this conversation because I've been able to read a couple of your books and you are a special person with a great message and uh, you make me feel more optimistic. And I feel like I got to know your parents and your family reading your books and a group I'd love to hang out with. So thank you so much for Anytime. spending the time they with us. They would love you. <laughs> they would love you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Kelly. You bet. See you soon. As I've said here before, the pace of progress in the medical field today is staggering. And it's great to hear that just as we are developing and delivering targeted treatments for physical health ailments, we're making similar strides in the field of behavioral health. And I like the way Kelly says, we're going to have to be very grown up about the way we review media coverage of science in general and embrace uncertainty as we do so. And how about once again, breaking news on Blue Sky. I can't wait to see Kelly's TED Talk in April. I'm sure it will be great. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Kelly Corrigan and that it was not at all metabolically taxing. And if you did, you might want to subscribe to Blue Sky wherever you get your podcast, and also follow the Optimism Institute on social media. Until next time, I'm the founder of the Optimism Institute and host of Blue Sky, Bill Burke, and I thank you for listening.